Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show tonight. Uh, this is Dave Emmons, the Dave Emmons Show, and and we have a syndication that we have to tell you about. It's a radio syndication through WODY Radio, and that's in Maryland. My buddy Eddie Carson there, and that that is uh, OdysseyRadioLive.com. And, uh, of course, this is the Dave Emmons Show, and we're syndicating through that, and he has the audio portion that he'll, he'll put up on his website. And my guest tonight is... Uh, a guy I respect and revere, and this guy has has done a lot of stuff, and he's he's been on radio quite a bit. He's he's got some you know some big hits, and you should listen to his show when you get a chance. Uh, he's great, and uh, this is Reverend Doctor Victor Furman. He's uh, he was a spiritual counselor, and he's an author whose deep and rich voice inspired the radio handle Victor the Voice. With his soulful sound, he helps people heal. He also does this through energy work and ceremony and is a host of a producer and Destination Unlimited. And that's a show I was on with him about a month ago and really enjoyed that. Uh, so professional, a lot more professional than me. And that's on a Wednesday night. They, he graduated from the uh, Ardain uh, Seminary in 1997, it was, and then it was 2020. He's a late bloomer, kind of like me, I guess. He, he finished the, his PhD, his doctorate in the seminary, in a new seminary is called, and he finishes his doctorate there. And the Reverend Dr. Victor has been marrying couples in love and counseling people challenged by love. And you listen to his message tonight, you'll hear where he's coming from. He's perhaps, uh, he's best known to audiences for his work with paranormal investigation teams, where he specializes in sending earthbound spirits into the light. And that's something else too. He has been featured on A&E's Unexplained, and Bravo's Pregnant in Heels. And also, he's been uh, spotlighted to perform televised weddings, and uh, and he's been a, a, an author, a co-author, Pet Prayers and Blessings. He's also done, he's a writer and researcher, Your Interfaith Wedding, The Goddess Pages, Wedding Goddess, and, and the key researcher for the books, Meta Physician, On Call for Better Health and Know Yourself. Victor is a creator of InterVision, a curriculum designed to teach psychic self-empowerment and healing with emphasis on these things being very natural rather than supernatural in support of the work of healers. But he's had a background uh, as a young child. He's had ET experiences. We talked about that. And we get we all through this show now, we go through different subject matter. And this guy knows quite a few topics, so we can cover a lot of ground. So I'm sure he's going to hit something that you're going to like. And uh, would you tell us a little bit about your early childhood? Dave, thank you so much for having me with you tonight. I really appreciate this. And the, the Reverend Doctor is only when I'm doing officiating weddings or funerals. And hopefully tonight we won't be doing either of yeah. those. <laughs> so, so just Victor is fine. I, but uh, as a child, uh, the first recollection I have at five years old of being contacted by beings who I referred to as my teachers and my experience I referred to as night school. And the reason I called it night school was because whatever I would learn from them, I would come back with information that I had no other source for. And when I share this with my parents, they labeled me as a child with an overactive imagination until I started saying things that they could research and find that were real. And uh, again, uh, no other source for, you know, a lot of kids, young kids back in the fifties and sixties wanted trucks, boys wanted toy trucks and they wanted models and things of that right. nature. Little soldiers. I want, yeah. To, uh, soldiers. I wanted to build radios. I built my first crystal radio when I was seven years old and mm. uh, a tube radio after that. And later on a transistor radio. So, and again, no, no training, no formal training. So that knowledge was coming from somewhere. Right. Uh, so I referred to all of my experiences as night school, and they were all good experiences. I'm one of these people who can honestly say that I've never had a negative experience in any of my contacts, either as a child or later in life. And it could be that I'm just the kind of person who has no fear in me. And so consequently, I'm not afraid. And uh, I, I took each of these experiences as a learning opportunity. You and, have a high uh, consciousness level too. Apparently. Well, well, thank you. I, I don't know about that, but yeah, yeah. But but it, I think it comes from the multiple lifetimes that I've lived, and we talk about that a little bit later. But um, so no fear, uh, just acceptance and gratitude for the fact that I had all of these experiences. 
something interesting, a couple of interesting shares. Um, about uh, 12 years ago, the FIONS, the Friends of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which was uh, founded by uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, had a conference here in New York City, and the keynote speakers were Whitley Strieber and his wife, Ann Strieber, who, his late wife. And uh, Ann had shared that after the book Communion came out, they had received thousands and thousands of letters, and they had filed them away. And then later on, she went through those letters, and she found that many people who had contact experiences also had, either before or after, an experience of seeing a departed relative in spirit. And when she said that, I remembered when I was seven years old, I was very close with my paternal grandfather. Uh, he was a very spiritual man, and his message to me was not as a child, but he would talk to me as, as a peer who would understand. And I was seven years old, and I was reading a book, and I looked up, and my grandfather was standing there. I said, Grandpa, where did you come from? He smiled, didn't say a word, and then all of a sudden he sort of dissolved, he disappeared. And I went into the living room of the house and I said to my mother and father, Grandpa was here. And they said, oh, you're imagining things again. And a few moments later, the phone rang with word that my grandfather had passed away, which kind of startled them. Obviously, they were upset about his passing. But the fact that I had that experience and reported it prior to the information coming was something that said, maybe it's not his imagination. Maybe there's something else going on around here. And you didn't get a spanking for that. And I did not get a spanking for that. I got spanked for other things, but I didn't get a spanking for that. Now, we're and, talking about uh, early ET extraterrestrial experiences, right? Uh, right. Yeah, we haven't mentioned that. Uh, so I just want to let people know that you're talking about experiences when you're a young kid through the ET experience, I guess. Right. So this, the first one that I remember is that I clearly remember is uh, when I was five years old, which would have been 1958. And then uh, the experience with my grandfather was two years later, which would have been 1959, 1960, uh, 1960. And uh, uh, that was my earliest experiences. You talked about uh, not getting uh, spanking. Um, one of the things that I did, as I mentioned, I built radios and things when I was young. Uh, inspired by my contact. Uh, but I also was a child scientist and experimenter, and I uh, used to take things apart like toasters and uh, appliances. And sometimes I was able to put them back together and sometimes not exactly. And that's where the punishment would come from no. when I would take something apart and I couldn't put it back right. together. Yeah. That was things telling you, I mean, giving you knowledge, wisdom and knowledge is what yeah. I ask for a lot of times in my prayers. To, to help me make better decisions in life and what I have to do and help you get through, uh, you know, your problems and your, your problems with your family being sick and things of that nature. So we have to, you know, bow to that quite a bit. Uh, but that's, you had those experiences up until about 1958. What happened after that? Uh, actually, the last childhood experience that I have conscious memory of would have been when I was 11. That would have been 19... Uh, 64 uh, was the last conscious contact experience. I've had experiences after, but mm -hmm. I have no recollection of them. Uh, the only thing that I have uh, to let me know that they actually happened uh, was the fact that I had a couple of implants, which we shared in common. Right. Actually, we talked about that. Uh, I had uh, funny stories that when I was first uh, interviewing Dave, he had mentioned an implant and he showed an x-ray of his left hand uh, between his thumb and his his first finger is his index finger. Same, exactly the same as you, yeah, right? And, yeah, and he was saying, here, I've got, I have an implant, show me that, and I started laughing, and I showed him my x-ray, we had the exact same implant between the thumb and the index finger, right in that web between the two fingers over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, another story that happened was uh, I attended a gathering of UFO experiencers, contactees in New Jersey, again, about 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, at lunchtime, they broke up and they had a special group just for contactees, a circle of us. And we got together and we were sharing our experiences and our stories. And this gentleman who was sitting adjacent to me was talking about he was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike one evening, saw a light following along on the side of the road, and he pulled over and then he had a lost time or missing time uh, experience. And when he came to, he went home and he found that he had a scar 
on his right leg, a triangular shaped scar on his right calf. And when he pulled up his pants leg and showed it to us, I started laughing. And he looked at me like, what are you laughing at? I pulled up my pants leg and showed him virtually the identical scar on my right calf. Triangle scar. Was there a, a scar inside, inside of it? Of I'm sorry, sir? Was there a scar inside of it, like a little round hole or anything? I, just just a triangular just triangular shaped oh. uh, scar, like the, like a triangle was cut out of the uh, out of the skin, mm -hmm. and uh, I have no implant there. I don't know what happened to it. Perhaps it had been taken back, uh, but the fact that we both shared that common experience was uh, I thought that was really really interesting. Right. Well, us experiencers do have similar. I've talked to a lot of them, and we have similar stories. And they're not stories. I call them experiences because a story could be sci-fi. This is not sci-fi. This is real stuff. And I've talked to a lot of people about that. And they hear these little clicking sounds. And I said, oh, my God, I hear that, too. You put those parts of the puzzle together just like you and I did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So any upfront ET experiences after that or it mostly they talk to you? Uh, there was a miracle healing that when you stationed in Korea with the Air Force. That's right. Uh, interesting story. Uh, I was in the Air Force from 1973 to 1979. 1975 and 1976, I was stationed in Seoul, Korea. And uh, I was with Armed Forces Radio and TV. I was a newscaster and a broadcaster there. I would do uh, radio and television news back then. And uh, I had a problem with my back. And a friend of mine said, try acupuncture. And I'd never had acupuncture before, but I'd heard that it was an effective way to treat pain. And uh, I went and I saw an acupuncturist. Now, little did I know that in those days, number one, the needles they used were not disposable. And number two, their sterilization methods were not exactly great. And also hepatitis B was endemic in Korea, meaning many people carried the disease without manifesting illness. So I had this acupuncture treatment. It actually helped my back, my back felt better. A couple of weeks later, I wake up one morning and I look in the mirror and my eyes are starting to turn yellow. I said, uh-oh, this isn't right. And I went to the military hospital, the army hospital there. And they looked at me and they said, you have hepatitis. And they admitted me right away. And uh, I noticed that they were treating me differently than when they were treating the other uh, airmen and soldiers who were also in the hospital with hepatitis. They were giving me shots of vitamin K, uh, which I later found out was a blood clotting factor because apparently this was affecting my ability for my blood to clot and other treatments that no one else was getting. And I was kind of curious as to why this was going on. And uh, the doctor told me, you are very seriously ill. Uh, in fact, they had the Red Cross send a telegram back to my mother here in New York saying that your son is very seriously ill, which is the military version of uh, grave condition. Yeah. And that my prognosis was not good, meaning that they expected that, that I wouldn't survive. In any event, uh, I started hearing a series of voices, which I uh, have been hearing throughout my life. But I heard a voice and the voice said, this is a voice inside my head, not my voice, but a voice inside my head saying, ask the doctor for a picture of a healthy liver. So the doctor came by and I said, do you have a picture of a healthy liver? And he said, why? I said, I just I'd like to see what a healthy liver looks like. He said, I have an anatomy book. I said, please, would you bring it to me so I can see what that liver looks like? So he did. He humored me. And he brought me the book and I started studying this picture for a few minutes. And then the voice said, put the book down and place your hands over your abdomen, over your liver. And I did. And I started feeling this wonderful warmth and this tingling sensation really can't explain, except it was a wonderful feeling, a very loving feeling. And I don't know how long I was doing that, but after a while, I fell asleep. The next morning at five o'clock, the nurse woke me up. She apologized. She said, we have to draw blood. And she took a blood sample. Two hours later, she came back and she said, I'm sorry, the laboratory messed up your blood sample. We have to take another sample. And she took another sample. An hour later, the doctor came in and said, after I gave you the book last night, what did you do? And I told him, he says, you're crazy. I said, why? He said, because last night, your liver enzyme levels were such that we thought you were going to be dead by morning. And this morning, your liver enzyme levels are virtually normal. And we've never seen that happen before. 
Now, you would have think that it would have been the aha moment, the eureka moment for me. I would have jumped up and said, ah, this is my path. This is what I have to do. But I wasn't ready. I was 26 years old and I was not ready to start that spiritual path. And, and so it was a wonderful healing, a miracle healing, and uh, I'm grateful for it. Uh, and just as a follow-up to that, a few months after that, about six months after that, they sent me for a liver scan. And they said that my liver, which they said had been 80% destroyed by the uh, hepatitis, had virtually rebuilt itself or repaired itself, regenerated itself. And then when I was out of the service, a few years later, the Red Cross here in New York was advertising for people who had hepatitis B to donate blood for the possibility of making vaccine. And I went and I gave a sample. And a week later, the doctor called me and says, we can't use your blood. And I said, why? He said, we can't find any evidence in your blood, the antibodies, that you ever had hepatitis B. So there's your miracle healing story and the question of the voice, that inner yeah. voice that gave and me that, that answer. Okay, that inner voice you're saying comes from within your head Correct. and not through your ears or through Correct. your audible system. Correct. So, so it's kind of like a telepathic, divine telepathic message that you're getting. It's a source message for sure. And uh, I'll give you another example. I was riding on a local highway a few years ago with my wife and son, and we were driving at 50 miles an hour, which was the speed limit. And uh, it was heavily trafficked, uh, but uh, the traffic was moving. And I was in the third lane, the left lane. And the voice came in and said, get out of this lane now. And as one who listens to the voice, I did that. I safely moved into the center lane. Within five seconds, there was a multiple car pileup in that left lane. And had I remained there, I would have been in the middle of that pileup. So again, an opportunity that the voice came to me, told me what to do and, and uh, prevented us from getting injured or, or, or something worse in the accident. That's uh, you know, yeah. synchronicity miracle. That's the, uh, what can you say? You, you, you took the right path. Uh, I was going to say, my wife usually tells me what to do and I hear her, but, but no, you heard a divine message right there. And that's, uh, you talk about being younger and not getting into the, uh, the, the miracles and the, the spiritual thing. But when I was in the military and we had a firefight, there was a, a guy that was, he was leaning while well, he's sitting down, he's loading his weapon. And he looked up at me with fear and he says, he said, Dave, do you believe in God? And I said, yes, I do. So at that time I was 20, maybe. And I said, yes, I, I believe in God. And he said, would you say a prayer for me? I said, yeah, I'm saying one right now. I said, but get up and fight. So, so that's what you had to do. So, yeah, that's, and when you say those messages come in your head, uh, it, it, they do. And I was, I, and you say, go quiet and listen. Absolutely. You tell us, give us a little less than that. Yeah. Listening. That's the key to this. Every, this is nothing. I'm not special. I'm a regular human being or part human being anyway, like, like everybody else. It could be a hybrid, yeah. It could be a hybrid. But, yeah. but the thing is, is that what we need to do is need to turn down the inner static and the inner uh, garbled voices and all the ego voices and all the things that's telling you what's right and what's wrong and what, what, what deficiency you have in your life and all the bad stuff. The voice that I'm talking about is a calm, positive voice sometimes firm when needed, but a calm and positive voice. And we all have the capacity to hear that voice. We just have to learn to listen. And one of the, you had mentioned my Enervision class that I used to teach many years ago. One of the lessons that I would teach in my Enervision class was that if you want to try getting in touch with that inner guy, the inner voice, the divine voice, whatever source you believe it's coming from, uh, relax yourself, do a little deep breathing, you don't have to meditate if you're not a meditator, but at least relax, close your eyes, and have a question ready, a relatively simple question at first, and then get into that place, take those breaths, relax, close your eyes, and ask the question, and then listen. Now, it may not happen immediately, but ultimately, you will start hearing answers. If the answers are calm and reassuring and, and give you good advice, that's the voice. If they're screaming at you and telling you what you're doing wrong, that's your ego or your own self-defeating voice. So listen for the soft, what they used to call the soft, still voice within. And you can't go wrong when you listen to those messages. Now, some people, that's called clairaudience when you hear that way. Mm -hmm. Some people 
actually get those messages in different ways. So, for example, you can be clairvoyant, you can see, you can be clairaudient, you can hear, you can be clair, I'm sorry, you can be clairsentient, you can feel. And some of us have multiple versions of that. Some of us have one version of that. But whatever way works for you. And the way you can find out is if somebody says something and you say, I hear you, you're probably clairvoyant. If somebody says something and you say, I see what you're saying, I'm sorry, clairvoyant is when you see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. If they say, I hear you, you're probably clairaudient. And I feel you, you're probably clairsentient. Or you could be a combination of those. But sort of play with this. It's a lot of fun to get uh, investigate this for yourself. Find out what your sense is, what your 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 extra senses, the extrasensory perception, yeah. and then work on developing that. Do you think guardian angels are watching over you? Or are they giving you the messages? Or well, I, I I think there can be an angelic component to this, depending upon how your framework goes. But I'll, I'll tell you a very quick and interesting angel story. Okay. In the nineteen nineties, late eighties, nineties. Um, I started attending a series of uh, uh, yoga classes because, again, I had a back issue at that time. And uh, the yoga teacher and I became very good friends. And she said, I love your voice. Would you start leading us in meditation? And I started leading meditation. And then uh, after leading meditation, uh, we started going on a series of retreats to a Zen monastery in upstate New York. And at one of these retreats, somebody mentioned the word Reiki. Now, I'd never consciously heard Reiki in this lifetime, but something about that word resonated with me. And uh, there were three of us, my teacher, myself, and one other. And they said, you know, that's something we're going to look at. This was October of that year. We'll, we'll look at it next year. Two weeks later, <laughs> we were in our first Reiki class together. And for those who are not familiar, just about everybody knows Reiki today. But for those not familiar, Reiki is a form of energy healing that came out of Japan. In any event, uh, so uh, the, the, we were in this Reiki class the very first day, and as the teacher was teaching us a series of exercises, he said, I'd like you to close your eyes, place your hands in the center of your chest, and see if you see anything appear to you. And I did, and as soon as he said that, I saw a bright energy being, um, not winged in the traditional sense, but a sense that it could be an angel, and I said, I think I see an angel. And he said, ask the angel its name. And without even asking, I immediately heard Gabriel. Now, wow. that night I went home. My daughter was 10 years old at the time. And I said to her, honey, do you want to try this Reiki stuff? She said, yeah. So she sat in a chair and I placed my hands above her head. And immediately she said, daddy, she said, I have this vision. I see I see grandpa who had passed away, and I see this one and that one, members of the family, some that she had never met in this lifetime, but who had passed. And she said, Daddy, there's an angel flying above them. I said, what's the angel's name? And immediately she said, Gabriel. So I had my confirmation, which was pretty amazing. Right. I, I think in the studies that I'm, I'm doing on a, on a book, uh, Angels and Watchers, uh, they, the ancient times, they, they said they had wings because they, they were able to fly. But angels can actually come through portals. They can come. The distance and time is no, no, no problem with them. And they don't really need wings. They just their whole their bodies are there. You know, they can come in in the shape of a human actually. So yeah, have you ever been touched or rubbed at night? Uh, uh, you know, like a, a caress on your arm or your head all the time, all That's... the time, especially times when I'm not not happy when I'm sad. Yeah. And I'll get a caress on my hair on the top of my head. And that's the caress of a mother or a father mm -hmm. saying everything's going to be all right. So you think it's our, it's our uh, past relatives that come back a lot of times that are kind of like the angel type thing? I believe so, yes. At least in my experience. A lot of this really happened. My mama, unfortunately, passed in the 2020, January of 2020 with the advent of COVID. Sorry about that. Uh, prior to COVID, actually, she uh, yeah. she had been sick for, thank you, she'd been sick for a while. Wow. Um, but after she passed, I started feeling that a lot more. And when, my dad passed when I was 15. And uh, very interesting, if I was walking down the street in, in Brooklyn, New York, of all places, and uh, not a place that you normally would associate with spiders coming out of trees or things of that nature. But if I was walking down the street and I was troubled by something, 
and thinking about it, I had the sensation almost like there were cobwebs touching the top of my head. And I said, dad, is that you? And that was the confirmation that I got. So he was there also. That's great. And you heard this message about your mother being sick, 6,000 miles away. Yeah. When I was stationed in Korea, this is the second year I was in Korea. Uh, one morning I had a message. Again, the voice came and said, call mom. She's not well. She needs to hear your voice and be comforted. And so I said, okay, I called. It was the night before in New York or the night, uh, you know, Korea was one day ahead, 12 hours ahead. And I called. And in those days you had uh, wired telephones and you could have multiple extensions of the same phone. And my mother and my sister picked up the phone simultaneously. And I said, mom, what's wrong? And my sister said, oh my God, how did he find out? <laughs> and it turned out she was going in for major surgery the next day. And immediately the voice said, tell her it's going to be fine. She's going to come through the surgery with flying colors and she's going to be 100% cured and healed after the surgery. And she was. And the comforting message that I gave her was very helpful in relaxing her prior to going. Into That's surgery. great. Any, any quick words? We're coming to the end of the, the first segment. Any quick words you can tell people out there that are depressed and they're down about what's going on in the world? I had a teacher who used to say that everything is unfolding in divine order. Right. And um, sometimes things that are happening in life, we don't understand. We could actually be upset about them. But ultimately, if we use our spiritual eyes rather than using our human eyes, the eyes of ego and hurt, we'll see that there's a plan in place. And my suggestion to everyone, if you're down right now, if you're concerned or worried, Start taking a, a practice of very simple meditation, of closing your eyes and breathing, allowing your breath to return to its normal pace, and just relaxing and listening or feeling for that reassurance. And it all starts with loving yourself on the inside. Mm -hmm. When you love within, then you can love without. Okay, and uh, where can we find you on the web? It's Ohm Times Magazine is the magazine. The radio is Ohm Times Radio, and both of my shows are on ohmtimes.com forward slash I O Amazon Mary forward slash and the name of the show, two shows, Destination Unlimited and Vox Dash Novus, which means the new voice. And my website is victorthevoice.com. Great. And I've been on his show and it's a, it's a professionally run show. That's for sure. And I really appreciate it. This is Dave Emmons, uh, Dave Emmons show. And uh, we're, we're also syndicated through WDY radio. That's in Maryland. My buddy, Eddie Carson is there and it's odyssey radio live.com. And we like to th uh, thank you. Wait for the, uh, the second segments coming up. We're getting into ETs and things of that nature. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back, everybody. And this is uh, actually the second segment of our show. And what we're going to do is uh, we're talking to Victor, the voice, Furman. This is the Dave Emmons Show, and we're being syndicated through WDY Radio. And that is odysseyradiolive.com. Listen to that on the website. And uh, we were getting into ETs and UTs, the ultra uh, terrestrials, but we're now we're getting into synchronicities. And this is somewhat how... Victor and I kind of synchronized a little bit on a few things with uh, ET experiences. Could you tell us a little bit about synchronicities? Synchronicity was a word that was coined by the father of psychoanalysis, Carl Jung. And he defined synchronicity as coincidence, meaningful coincidence, without causal connection. In other words, there's no way that these things should have come together, but they did, and they're meaningful. So it goes beyond the idea of coincidence. And uh, I have come to learn in my life that there are no coincidences. Right, there isn't. Yeah. There are no coincidences and that everything that uh, transpires is a synchronicity. Everything has a higher purpose. I had a the blessing of a wonderful teacher in the seminary in the 1990s, 1995 to 97, who would say that there is a word, there's a word in ancient Hebrew or in Hebrew that says hakol beseda, and the literal translation means everything in order. But he would say it actually means everything in divine order. There's a reason for everything that happens. We may not see it, we may hate it, we may disgust, be disgusted by it. But if you step back 
And rather than use our human eyes to look at these things and use our spiritual eyes mm -hmm. and look at it not as a snippet, but as a timeline, you'll recognize the, the, the beauty of what this is about. Um, one of the things that I did in my graduate uh, thesis from the seminary back in the 90s was to talk about the book of Ruth from the uh, Old Testament. And very simply, the story of Ruth is Ruth and her sister were Moabites, and they were married to two Israelis, to two Hebrews, and their mother-in-law, and they lived outside of Israel, which, which was experiencing famine at the time. And then in a series of uh, really devastating events, her father-in-law dies, her husband dies, Ruth's father-in-law, and, and then the sister's uh, husband also dies. Right. So it leaves Naomi, the mother-in-law, and the two daughters, the Moabites. And she says to them, you can't come with me. I have to go back to my people in Israel. You can't come with me. And the one sister takes off, and Ruth says to her mother-in-law, where you go, I go. Your God is my God. She was a woman of deep, deep and abiding faith. Goes back, works the fields by day, works the fields extra for her mother-in-law to bring extra food by night. And she falls in favor with the landowner who happened to have been her mother-in-law's cousin. He brings her in, falls in love with her. He marries her. They have one night together and he dies. And that's the end of the book. And you say, what? what's going on here? <laughs> well, that one night together resulted in the birth of a son. And through that son comes the lineage that leads to King David of Israel. And through David's lineage comes Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. Synchronicity. Yes. There's a plan. There's a, there's a plan. Everything is unfolding in divine order. You look at the snippet of her life. What a horrible. She's a wonderful woman, a faithful woman, did all these great things. Why did she deserve it? Well, it's not about deserving. It's about what her goodness promoted and brought forth. So that's that's a great example of that. But getting back to personal synchronicities, I think it was 1990, James Redfield came out with a book called The Celestine Prophecies. And it was basically a spiritual message written as an adventure book, an adventure novel, where his protagonist goes through a series of meetings with people who give him a series of insights. And with each insight, if he moved on, if he accepted that insight and went for the next one and the next one, it set up this chain of synchronicities. So each time something is presented to us in our life, I, just getting back to that story, I looked at that book, read that book, and I said, if you take away the adventure story aspect of it, because it was an adventure story, that's what I've, I've been going through. That's exactly what I've been experiencing. And it comes down to the fact that each time you're presented with things in your life, you have three choices. Someone comes to you, and says, here's an opportunity for something, whatever it is. Reiki is a good example of my, what happened with Reiki in my case. Um, you have three choices. You can either dismiss it out of hand, I'm not interested. You could say, ah, that's interesting, but not for right now. Or you can say, yes, that really means something to me. I'm going to pursue that. And when you say yes, the next yes comes, and the next yes comes, and the next yes comes. So just to give you examples from my life, uh, I got out of the service. I had been in armed forces radio and TV when I was stationed in Korea and, and the service. I was doing news, military news. and That's where you got news. that great voice. Well, the, I was born with this voice. <laughs> yeah, that's I know. another story. I know. <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. In any event, so I was doing the news. And uh, when I got out of the Air Force, I had applied to a bunch of radio and TV stations. And everybody I applied to was willing to hire me. But a wife and, I had a wife and a baby at the time, a young baby, and they wanted a six-day work week. And in those days, unless you can get into a big city, which is hard to do, the wages were not the greatest. And I said, I can't uh, ask my wife and child to suffer this while I build a career in broadcasting. So I put an ad in the New York Sunday Times, and I said, let my communication skills enhance your business. Because I had a bit of a business background from my dad when he was alive. I put the ad in on a Sunday. I got a call from a guy on a Monday. He interviewed me on Tuesday. He hired me on a Wednesday. And I became involved in the welding equipment and compressed gas industry. And self-taught, didn't know anything about welding, didn't know anything about gases, taught myself everything. And that led to a 42-year career in that field. That paid the day job. That, that was the day job. That paid the salary. 
and about mm -hmm. then uh, the other things that manifested the seminary which was you know evenings and, and weekends and, uh, and other things somebody said to me how do you balance the fact that you have this day job in industrial sales and engineering and so on and this other work that you do the spiritual work that you do without even thinking about it i said the day job pays my salary i said the other work pays my solary this word solary came out of me yeah i actually trademarked it and i'm my my first personal book my own book that i haven't been a co-author or contributor to is going to come out i'm hoping for at the end of this year it's going to be solary the compensation of spirit and that's exactly what this is for me I've so got getting to, back to the uh, thank I've you got so, keep, i gotta keep out a lookout for that book that sounds a, good a, a, absolutely oh. and so getting back to synchronicity yes so 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 Reiki. So I was involved in uh, that the the yoga class, and the yoga class led to the meditation. Meditation led to Reiki. Reiki led me to life changing events, including going to the seminary. Because in those days, if you wanted to go into a hospital and do laying on of hands, you either had to be licensed as a massage therapist or ordained in a faith where laying on of hands was considered to be a practice of sacrament. So I couldn't quit my day job and go to massage school for three years. But again, through these wonderful synchronicities, I found out about this wonderful new seminary of New York, enrolled in it, and uh, weekend trainings and evening trainings, and was ordained an interfaith minister in 1997. I know you probably influenced a lot of people uh, because of your character and because of what you know, because you're, you're, you're a great inspirational guy, and you've made all the right decisions and synchronicity. Have you actually laid hands on people and have you healed people? I'll give you an example. Yes. And I'll give you an example of one. We used to have a thing called a Reiki marathon. And the Reiki marathon was someone would come to someone's home and would have a massage table, which is used for Reiki or a relaxing table that can, they can lay down on and receive the healing. And uh, that started at eight o'clock in the morning and ended at 10 o'clock in the evening. And there would be people coming in and out all day who are Reiki masters and Reiki practitioners and giving this woman Reiki. And it was my turn to work with her. And my hands were drawn over her abdomen. And I heard two names. And I said, who are, and I'm not going to mention names, obviously, but who are this guy and this guy? And she started crying. She said, that's my husband and my son. And I said, why are you crying? She says, because I feel as if they have abandoned me. And she had ovarian cancer. Oh. So we all worked on her. We healed on her. And as one of the things that I've come to learn in the practice of energy is that no matter what our intention is, we want to heal everybody. But sometimes curing an illness is not what that person's highest need or highest good is. And she had a bit of a remission, but unfortunately came back and she did pass. But that sense of connecting with the knowledge that her husband and her son, that she had this feeling of abandonment, gave her an emotional healing mm -hmm. and allowed her to at least live out her life with a sense of dignity and a sense of self-acceptance and self-worth. I can so, see that because I've had relatives that we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and it didn't do any good. And I thought, well, God is going to take them anyway. That's what, that's what he wanted to do. And that's what their fate was. So we, we can't take, we can't stop God from doing what he's going to do. That's for sure. Again, that whole concept of everything is unfolding according to a divine plan, divine order, uh, a, a higher energy order, whatever you'd like to call it. But these situations manifest that way. And they also give us an opportunity to have compassion and love. And as you well know, what we need in this world more than anything else yes, right now. is for common folk like us to embrace each other and love each other and support each other through whatever's going on. And I'm not going to go any further than say whatever's going on. We know there's uh, Victor, negative energy. Uh, uh, Victor, do you believe in a penile, penile gland? That's uh, the third eye. Right. The penile, the pineal gland, the, yeah, they yeah. call it the third eye. Um, is something that's been used in many cultures. Uh, you see it in Hinduism, where they wear mm -hmm. uh, a bindi, which is a decoration over that area, and other places do that too. And so uh, the pineal gland, I believe, is one of the energy centers, receptors 
of the things that we've been talking about, the energy uh, that we've been talking about. And whenever I want to focus on something and get an answer, in other words, sometimes the, like I said, the voice comes without me even asking for it. But when I want an answer, what I'll do is I'll close my eyes, I'll briefly meditate, I'll, vi I'll visualize my vision pointing in, inward toward that spot and ask my question. And when I do that, I get my answer. You know, in combat, that happened to me several times. And my guys, I was the platoon sergeant, and my guys were looking at me. I went quiet. When I want to make a decision, I go quiet and I listen, just like you're saying. Listening is very important. So I listened and I sat there and, and the guys were screaming at me. And this happened even in a refinery where I was sitting there. We, we were having a lot of pressure problems. And they were screaming at me. I sat there and I just quiet. And I took out the door and I knew what the problem was. And I come back and I told them what to do. And they, they apologized to me. You know, I said, I, I said, that's the way I have to do things. I have to think. And actually I was doing things. I didn't think I even knew how to do that message, that voice. Yes. Absolutely. I, I heard you all go and I was just saying, yes, yes. <laughs> and here's another example, another synchronicity. So March of 2020, uh, because of the advent of COVID, and especially in the New York area, it was getting really intense here. And the company that I was working for said, look, you're 67 years old. You're, the majority of your work is face-to-face -face contact with people, because I was also doing certified welding inspection and engineering and so on and so forth. We're afraid of you being exposed, getting sick, and having COVID. And in those days, they, everybody thought COVID was very serious, a death sentence, and it turned out to be for many, many people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. They said, we want you to take an early retirement. And I wasn't ready to retire. And I said, okay, no problem. The very same day, I got a call from the current administration of the new seminary. And they said, would you like to join us for an intensive this weekend? I said, sure. Which is a training session, teaching, sharing my experience. Uh, then they came back and said, you never completed your doctorate with the seminar. You have your master's in spiritual counseling. You want a doctorate. In, and my doctorate is actually called Doctor of Spiritual Coaching and Direction is my actual full doctorate, mm -hmm. spiritual direction. And uh, I said, okay. And I went and I got my doctorate and finished it. Then they said, you know, we're thinking about bringing back the interfaith temple online, which was the ordaining body of the seminary. And would you be interested in joining the um, ministry team. And I said, absolutely. And I became the minister of communication and started participating in their services. Do you ever uh, say no? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's yes. I, yes. I've actually learned to say no to certain yeah. situations, which I recognize are not. I'm not saying I was a negative, yeah. but uh, no, no, absolutely. You're say always no. positive. Yeah. You're say, always positive. Yeah. But, but the positive things kept coming and coming and coming. Yeah. And then, uh, and then one of the things we were hoping for was that we'd have donations and and uh, be able to draw some type of a stipend from that because well, mo I was on social security. I didn't have any extra income. I had some savings, but I was starting to tap into my savings. I really needed to have work, real day job work. And mm -hmm. so in January, a friend of mine called me and said, I need a project manager. You want to come to work for me? This is a guy I know for 40 years. I said, I would love to. So I started working for him. It was originally part-time. Then it was three days a week, then four days a week, and then a month and a half ago became five days a week. Wow. So it's wonderful. I'm doing the work that I know, the, the welding uh, engineering and some of the other stuff that I know, and uh, helping him and helping him with his business. And it's also providing that income that I so desperately yeah. really needed, that extra income because uh, Social Security you unfortunately have, isn't that enough. You have a guardian angel, there's no doubt. You're, we all do. Yeah, I know. We all do. And I, I read the story about Washington, wrote about George Washington, where he was shot shot at four times and they missed him. And it's uh, amazing. And he had two horses shot off from under him, but they missed him. And he had a guardian angel. Now, this interfaith lessons and messages, that's what you were just talking about. Right. And uh, so let's go on to shared implants. Now, we've got some. Yes. Implants. Yes. Synchronicity. So when I started getting ready for my interview with you, I saw a photograph that you had of an implant between your thumb and your index. And I started laughing. <laughs> I said to myself, he's not going to believe this. And I showed you a, an x-ray that was taken of my left hand in the exact same place, the exact same. <laughs> no, I was amazed. And I, and I, 
Yeah. I, and I had another implant in my, in my left uh, calf. Mm -hmm. and I, I took that out and I got mm -hmm. pictures of that. Uh, yeah. It, uh, I think I got an implant in my left ear too, because I got a ringing when I touch my tongue with my teeth. So mm -hmm. the implant thing, do you have any other implants that you know? Of? Interestingly enough, not there anymore. But I was attending an experiencer contactee conference in New Jersey about eight or nine years ago. And at lunch break, they had a special gathering, a circle for just contactees. And uh, we're sitting uh, in a circle and each of us sharing our story. And this guy to my left starts talking about how he was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike one evening. And he saw something following a light that was following from, mm -hmm. from deep into the woods. And he pulled over. And he had some type of lost time experience. The next day, he noticed that he had a triangular scar on his right calf. And he realized he had received an implant. And I started laughing. And he says, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I pulled up my pants leg and I showed him the identical scar. Oh, my, my goodness. Leg. There is another synchronicity there. Uh, what do you think the implants are for? Do you know? Or do you, you can guess that, Victor? My guess, again, my experiences have always been positive. I can't think of one time that I've had a negative contact experience or something that made me afraid or, and that just could be me who I am because I'm not a fear-based person. I'm a person who embraces the fact that whatever is happening, again, has a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be a couple of things. It could be a tracking device. Um, I have this checked for any type of emissions. There's no emissions that are measurable uh, with, with our electronic equipment, radio frequency right. or so on uh, available. You know, I just, maybe it's just their way of saying, hey, don't forget we're here. Uh, maybe it's rub the magic implant. It will uh, show up for you. I haven't tried that yet, but maybe uh, I will. The one on my left leg I took out, it was carbon-based. It was just a little three-eighths of an inch by maybe a quarter of an inch piece of a, a, like a little lump of coal. And when I got into the microphone, I mean, not microphone, I'm thinking of the microphone because <laughs> this here, but the microscope, mm -hmm. and I checked it out, and I even had a biologist friend. She was a supervisor in the hospital. She looked at it. it. They looked like brain neurons coming off of it, like like little octopi. And I thought, oh, that's weird. She says she's never seen anything like that. It mm -hmm. could be something attaching itself to your nervous system, maybe. Absolutely. A way of getting in there and maintaining something maybe that's where the messages are coming from maybe yeah. that's where the messages are coming from but i know we have a couple of minutes left and i just want to share one more thing sure, we got we have more than a couple of minutes i think oh yeah okay okay so when i was uh early on my path i was attending a series of gatherings uh, here in new york uh, this woman she was in her early 80s at the time and she'd have these friday night gatherings they used to call them salons Mm -hmm. And people would come in and there'd be guest speakers talking about various metaphysical topics, spiritual topics, metaphysical topics, uh, some uh, uh, things about energy and so on and so forth. At one of these meetings, there was a presenter who was giving a message. And I just did not connect with that message. It just didn't make sense. It didn't resonate with me. And as the evening was breaking up, this woman said to me, she said, Victor, can I speak with you for a few minutes before you leave? And I said, absolutely. And everyone had gone and she took my hands and she looked into my eyes and she said, like a mom, and she said, Victor, I saw that you were not comfortable with what was being shared this evening, but I'd like to say something to you. She said, God does not require that we be holy, but God would love if we were whole. Right. Meaning if we embrace who we are as we are, do the best we can with our purpose and our life and our bodies and just do what we're here to do, which is to be kind to one another, loving to one another, caring for one another, listening to one another, a big thing that we can use in our world today, listening rather than shouting and screaming at one another. Marriages, especially, you know, I was, well, yeah. you know, I was talking <laughs> to my 94 year old mother and she's had a lot of pain in her back and, and her hands, arthritis. And she, she sounds like a 50 year old on the, on the phone. She's very, she, her mental acuity is, is really great. I mean, it's much better than Biden's that's for sure. But uh, I shouldn't talk political. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. But uh, she was telling me, you know, sometimes they get tired. She said, this pain just makes me not want to keep going. And she told my sister, she said, I don't think we go anywhere after death. And that's another question I want to ask you here pretty soon. But she, I told her, I called her up and said, Mom, we do go somewhere. I said, I've been on the other side 
during my experiences and I've seen other worlds and I've seen other beings, you know, and I said, we travel and we go and I have these freezing episodes. So I know we go. So do we have past lives and do we go somewhere? Could you tell us a little bit about that, Victor? Absolutely. I, I my, my sense is, um, I've been to places and seen places that I've never been in this lifetime and immediately recognized them. I have met people, especially doing the podcasts. And by the time the interview is over, I said, you're not just a guest on my show. You're my family. I know who you uh, are. Yeah. We've been, we've yeah. traveled. And you and I, Dave, we've right. traveled together before. There's no question about I, it. Yeah, I feel a connection. Yeah. I, I, but with, when my mother passed in January of 2020, uh, and uh, that year, a lot of people sorry, through COVID, you. thank you, a lot of people through COVID and other things were passing. This poem came through me. And I think this poem kind of summarizes my feelings about that. And with your permission, I'll share that poem sure. with you. You go right ahead. The poem is called Circles and Rings. And I just have to pull it up for a moment. I'll have it here in one second. And uh, Circles and Rings is what it's called. And it starts like this. The path of great beauty in so many things, from atoms to galaxies, circles and rings, natural wisdom that dwells there within, from naught to 360, that magical spin. We circle each other in gravity's dance, as Gaia circles soul, the solar romance, as Luna circles us in life-giving motion, drawing the tides and inner emotion. And the age of the oak is found in its rings, as in woman and man and all living things. And when the rings stop and life comes to an end, we'll all circle back and dance once again. Really? That sounds good. And you make it sound good. I mean, it's a good <laughs> poem, but you, you, you give it that luster, that voice. Uh, you're, you're great. You could have been a Shakespearean back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Not from Brooklyn. There's okay. No Shakespearean. In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. You don't have a Brooklyn accent. I okay. lost it along the way, thankfully. I, I, once in a while, the Brooklyn boy comes out. Yeah. Uh, where is home? Where? I mean, where do we go? I live in Queens. Oh, oh, yeah. not, not the earthly yeah. home. Yeah, not the earthly home. The question I wanted to answer to my mom. Victor. My my sense, my origin is the Pleiades. I okay. uh, have a lot of friends who also feel that they come from the Pleiades, but that doesn't mean it's the only place. Right. I think we come from wherever we need to go to learn. And I think each existence is an opportunity either to learn or to serve. Um, people have called me an old soul, like I've been around for a long, long time. Even when I was a kid, they used to call me an old I, soul. I feel that. Yes. That's it. Oh. That's it. We've been around for a long, long time. And we got to have a purpose. And, and purpose. I, my later in my life, I'm writing books. I never was a writer. And I have a purpose now to get the word out, my bucket list. And I'm sure you're at the, you're at the age. You didn't want to give up. You didn't want to stop working. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So great. I'm going to be 70. I'm going to be 70 in January. I don't know what that means. I, I don't feel what 70 <laughs> okay. is. When you turn be. 70, you disappear. Is that what it yeah, is? That's okay. what it is. I'm 73. And okay. at 70, I disappear. I can walk in the store and nobody sees me. That's funny. That's <laughs> that is. Funny. I heard that on a talk show one time. Uh, Greg Gutfeld, I'll give him a plug. But he said, he said, when you turn 70, he said, you go invisible anyway, unless you're a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, in my mind, my mind is still a youthful mind. So, right. uh, you know, and my body ain't bad either. It's not too bad for 70. So. I got a bad back, but everything else is okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so so good to talk to you. So we're going to be going to heaven and after we're, we leave our bodies here. So we're going somewhere that's better than what's here. Do you think we're here for a, a, a reason, a test? Are we being tested? Not a test. You know, people talk about karma where you have to come back to pay back for what your deeds were in your past life. I don't look at it that way. I don't think there's a hell. I don't believe in a, in a place of perdition or hell. Mm -hmm. I think what each lifetime is, is an opportunity to learn a few things, to learn some lessons, to grow in the process of learning that, those lessons. Right. And I think the greatest lesson for most people that I know today is loving oneself, to find within thyself the love that the 
creator, as you understand the creator, that the universe, that love is yours. And don't let anyone take that away from you. And then if you find that love within, you can share that love without. And that for me, that's the mission. That's the mission. That's the message. I want my wife to hear this program. She normally doesn't listen to any of my programs, but I want her to listen to you. Uh, because she's into that vein of thinking too. But uh, tell us a little bit about where we can contact you and what your show is all about. We just have about a minute left or so. Sure, I do two podcasts for Ohm Times Radio. The website is ohmtimes.com. That's O-M-T-I-M-E-S.com forward slash I-O-M for Mary forward slash and then the two show names. The first show on Wednesday night is Destination Unlimited. That's Destination Dash Unlimited. And the show on Thursday night is Vox Novus, Vox Dash Novus, which means the new voice. And you can find all that stuff. My website is victorthevoice.com. Great. Nice show. I loved it as as I knew I would. And we're being syndicated through WDY Radio, and that's uh, odysseyradiolive.com. This has been the Dave Emmons Show. And my gracious and good ho- uh Actually, I feel like he's a host because I, I was on his show and now I'm talking to him. But, you know, it's Victor, the voice, Furman. Good night, everybody.